Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My JavaScript Story. Uh, this week, we're talking to the one, the only, the rock star with the beard, Mike Hardington. Mike, you want to say hi and uh, give us a little more of an intro? Hey, how's it going? Um, yeah, my name is Mike Hardington. I'm a developer slash developer advocate at Ionic. I like to tweet about my cats and uh, and do some woodworking on the side. Nice. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. And we've had you on a few shows. We've had you on Adventures in Angular a couple of times. Um, we've had you on uh, My Angular Story. We talked to you about, uh, well, we did one with you and Eli Lucas live at uh, NGConf. Yeah, that one, that one was a lot of fun. It was, uh, you had like this really nice setup with the whole like yeah, kind of podcast booth. Yeah. Podcast booth. I was like, oh, I want one of those for my home office. Yeah, um, it looks like I'm probably going to be taking it to a few more conferences this year. So, oh, sweet. Just working that out. But yeah. And then, um, yeah, we did another My Angular Story with you, it was episode 50, I think. Yeah. So it's, it's fun just to see where things are at and, uh, yeah, see where things go from there. But you're a developer advocate at Ionic and came on JavaScript Jammer and talked about Stencil, which is web component stuff. Yeah, this is for Ionic these days. And yeah, we, we, we've had some other conversations in person and over the internet. Yeah, I, I tend to be pretty active, you know, active for myself in the JavaScript community. And whether it's partaking in conversations about JavaScript or actually writing it, I love, I love working with it. And I love the community that is around it. And it's just where I feel at home. Awesome. So uh, yeah, I, this is more of a conversation about how you got into programming and JavaScript and things like that. Uh, we've done this before. But yeah, let's just uh, jump in and talk about you and, and how you got into all this stuff. Um, to start out, I'm curious, how did you get into programming? Well, the, like, the very, very first programming in air quotes that I've, that I've done was uh, in a high school computer science class it was like uh, vb visual basic just kind of like hello world and programming teaching us like what is a variable what is what are numbers uh did that in high school and did it for a year and it was super fun i think like our final project at the end of the first semester was making tic-tac-toe oh was, fun yeah it was, it was having never done anything like that before and haven't been told, okay, here, are, here's what, you know, the rules, the tic-tac-toe, but can you explain these rules in a way that a computer would understand and be able to program that and figure out all the logic? Mm -hmm. So there was like this weird, I don't know, it was like kind of this really interesting challenge of how can you do something that is intrinsically that you know, but now you have to explain it to a computer and then also figure out all these different conditions. And it kind of got the, all the basics of programming kind of right then and there. Right. And then I didn't touch it for, or touch programming, I guess, for a couple of years until college and post-college when I started doing things like with Flash and animations and doing Flash web apps and stuff mm -hmm. at the time. Nice. So uh, how is your tic-tac-toe foo now? I feel like if I was to, if I was to be told to like make tic-tac-toe again, I probably could do pr 
do it well. I may not be able to do the CSS that great, but I could definitely program the rules to tic-tac-toe and uh, figure out how to do it without a framework would be, would be the fun part. Right. But yeah, after, um, after that and getting into college and then doing, I was in college for design and like animation had been stuff that I was, I had been interested in. And so with that, like doing, it was flashback in the day. Mm -hmm. Once you started working with that and figuring out, okay, well, you know, I could do hand animation every single frame, but then there are all these things with like, how do you make a camera or like a virtual camera inside of flash? Okay. Well now how do I make a play button? And you kind of dive into action script a little bit. And this, this was action script two. And I eventually made a migration to like action script three. And it was just one of those things where it's like, I never thought of it as programming. Mm -hmm. It was just like, Oh, this thing will make me be better at making little, little animations here and there. Uh, until I found out that, okay, I can actually use this to build websites. Right. Um, and that was pretty fun. Uh, until, you know, after college and getting in a real job and then letting my boss know, oh, I can do this for, for, you know, our company's like mini sites or these mini programs that we want to have. And then the owner of the company pulling out an iPad and getting a little annoyed that none of the things that worked on his laptop worked on the iPad. Uh, so <laughs> because this was uh, this is the post Steve Jobs, uh, dear app, uh, dear Adobe kind of letter of just I don't want your insecure software on my I- beautiful uh, iOS devices. Oh yeah, I remember like, that. I remember a lot of people freaking out. I mean, that was like an entire industry of people who who had bet on this one technology. And, oh yeah, like. It was such a good tool to use at the time. And it, from a technical decision, I guess it makes sense why they blocked it. But it was really frustrating because that, I was like, well, now what do I do? I don't know anything else. I barely knew this, I would say. And now I have to figure something else out. And that led me down to JavaScript, which a couple of Stack Overflow posts kind of said, well... If you know some action script, you should be able to get by. And it totally was not the the most like actual. <laughs> like, no, this is nothing like action script at the time. I don't know what I'm doing. This is uh, quite difficult. Yeah. And then I just kind of dove into JavaScript and, and mostly self-taught and no actual boot camp or degree or college degree yeah. in programming. But... Yeah, I guess that's kind of how I got into it out of from Visual Basic to Flash to JavaScript. Well, well and it's interesting too. I've, I talked to a number of people that, yeah, they made the transition from ActionScript and Flash to JavaScript. And in some ways, most of the people I've talked to, yeah, they talked about it being somewhat similar. I mean, they're both based on ECMAScript. So yeah. like, th- in, in that sense, it wasn't terrible. But yeah, some of the paradigms were drastically different. Well, it's funny, like now, like when, when Angular was releasing their 2.0 and they came out with the, with, you know, they're showing off Decorator. I was like, I've seen that before. I know what that is. That's, that's from my action script three days. Yeah. It's like, what's old is new again. And everything's just very, uh, very uh, cyclical and just come back and like, okay, I finally, I finally understand what those little at the uh, symbols that mean in, uh, in my old yep. code. Now I can apply that to JavaScript. I was like, I'm ahead of the curve. There you go. The man with the experience. Experience is a very, very, <laughs> uh, very generous term. Uh, definitely, I wouldn't say I was knowledgeable, but I had some bruises to show from my early attempts at learning to program. Oh, I see. So, so you, you could come back and remember the good old days from your abusive relationship with flash. It was, it was like, I could get, remember the old days with flash, but then also realize this does not have all the good things that flash had. And then while I'm working through it and kind of getting everything, like working in the apps that I was making, I was like, 
All right. Well, this doesn't exist. How can I do do this in JavaScript? And then finding out all these this ecosystem and finding like uh, finding like the super obvious things that would be obvious for I guess mm-hmm. most people, but weren't obvious to me. And then have like, okay, well, I can do all this cool stuff with uh, with this library called uh, jQuery. But then hearing all these people like, oh no, you don't need jQuery for that. You can do all these things like. But I don't know all those things. I need yeah. to use jQuery, right? It was just a really interesting kind of learning when you already know some things, but in a totally different language. And right. then having to come over to another part and just like, all right, well, you know the ideas. How do you translate those ideas into this new thing? Right. So one thing that I... I'm curious about is when you got into programming and, and you, you know, you're building these things in Flash or, you know, ActionScript, what kinds of things did you build? Was it all web stuff? And were there particular functions or functionality that you're proud of having done? So there was a bunch of um, the company that I had worked for was a manufacturer of scientific analytical instruments. So like they made these really complicated machines that scientists would use in their in their labs for analyzing water, analyzing coffee, beer, wine, like anything that they could use to just what is the pH for this or Mm -hmm. all these different measurements. And it was, you know, very heavy instruments and a very technically uh, deep like product. So it's like you there was so much information that. No, you could only that you that was part of the single thing, and you couldn't really print it out or load up a whole website uh, to show it off. So we wanted to create like these really specific apps, more or less, at the time that you could like go over all the products, show like details about each individual component. I think one of them was this huge Pelican style case where we had all the pro- the product itself in it and all the accessories. Right. We had those little targets where you could just hover over, click on it, and then animate to the new, to like the detail about that individual page or that individual thing. And there was a lot of this like interactive animated stuff that our, the company owner was, you know, he really liked, he really liked it and was really all sold in the flashy style of, oh, well, you're clicking this and you get a little zoom in and things are kind of flying all around. So, that was that was some of like the first real things I was building, um, and you know they were pretty uh, rough to say the least. You know, in terms of code that code that was used, but I was like super impressed. We got this one where we finally fe- built like a three sixty degree image viewer, and I was I spent a really long time figuring out how to do that. And I was like, as soon as I figured it out, I was like, oh, I'm. I, I'm so proud of this. And I was like showing it off to everyone kind of in my on my floor. I was like, look, look what you can do. Just drag and you can see everything from the different angle. And I was, that was like the first proud moment I had because I was like, I figured that out. And mm-hmm. it, it it wasn't something I, I think I expected or was prepared to know. Or it was something I didn't think I was capable of figuring out by myself. And I was like, I did this thing. And it was it, it was the big kind of like, okay, maybe I could do this more than like art and design. This will be more fun and more fulfilling. One of the biggest pain points that I find as I talk to people about software is deployment. It's really interesting to have the conversations with people where it's, I don't want to deal with Docker. I don't want to deal with Kubernetes. I don't want to deal with setting up servers. I don't, you know, all of these different things. And in a lot of ways, DevOps has gotten a lot easier. And in a lot of ways, DevOps has also kind of embraced a certain amount of culture around applications, the way we build them, the way we deploy them. And I've really felt for a long time that developers need to have the conversations with DevOps or adopt some form of DevOps so that they can take control of what they're doing and really understand when things go to production, what's going on so that they can help debug the issues and fix the issues and find the issues when they go wrong and help streamline things and make things better and slicker and easier so that they'll more generally go right. So we started a podcast called Adventures in DevOps. 
And I pulled in one of the hosts from one of my favorite DevOps shows, Nell Shamrell Harrington from the Food Fight Show. And we got things rolling there. And so this is more or less a continuation of the Food Fight Show where we're talking about the things that go into DevOps. So if you're struggling with any of these operational type things, then definitely check out Adventures in DevOps. And you can find it at adventuresindevopspodcast.com. And so, yeah, so the, the Steve Jobs thing forced you over to JavaScript. Um, yeah. are, are you happy with that move? Would you, would you have been happier staying with Flash? Uh, I, um, I'm kind of, I'm, I was kind of happy about it. Uh, I'm knowing where things are now. I'm really happy that I'm now not doing Flash. And I don't think, I don't think ActionScript was like my, my language. Like I could write it and I could be, uh, I could be productive in it. But it's not like once I found kind of JavaScript and I spent like that time getting to know it and reading all the books and reading all the articles and trying to figure out how do I JavaScript. Like once I figured that part and I could actually, I had actually a few things under my belt to like say I was, I could build with it. That's when I was like, all right, this JavaScript stuff is pretty neat. There's a, uh, I don't have to, op- I don't have to worry about this timeline. I can just write a, write something. And when the page loads, it'll do that thing. And then I can click a button and it'll also do this thing. So it was, it was nice to know that I had less overhead and I had less to think about. So I'm happy that I'm sick. I st- ended up at JavaScript. Flash, thankfully, went the way of being killed off by most websites and most browsers. Yeah, well, a, a lot of people started getting those smart devices or smartphones, you know, the iPhone in particular, and then the iPad. And yeah, I mean, it, it was a large enough market segment to where, yeah, people just could not build an app. I mean, on the there, web in Flash and expect everybody to be able to use it. And I think that's what did it in. Yeah. And, you know, all the sites, they were, like, while they ran, they were, they were relatively heavy. Like, yeah. anytime you built something with Flash and uh, you, you, built, you built a project and then you upload it, it was noticeably a heavy, uh, you know, file size, which on the desktop, Maybe desktop and corporate Wi-Fi, maybe that's not so much of an issue. But as I was like building these things internally for you know our sales team at the time, we'd be giving them not the best of laptops. They're going to trade shows and showing off these products to potential clients and then having to load it up on you know a, a big trade show conference Wi-Fi was it would take you know forever it felt like to download and like start up the entire thing so you'd be waiting there trying to explain to them like what you're actually trying to show them and all the products and then by that time that it would load they'd either be like not interested anymore versus like javascript where it's like there is no vm there's no kind of overhead of this large language and this large uh vm more or less it just loaded because it was built right in. So it was overall, overall like a good thing to have moved to JavaScript. Now you mentioned jQuery. So when you came over and switched to JavaScript, it was before the time of Angular and things like that, right? It was pretty much, it was very pre Angular 1.0. Backbone was still like, still the one in charge of all the JavaScript frameworks at the time. And Ember was kind of around. And most of those things, I, I, I don't think I ever really felt like I needed them. And so I would just write all this JavaScript file, this, you know, either one big JavaScript file and just use jQuery for all the things I was building. And it ended up working out like, I didn't have this huge overhead of, okay, well, is this going to be faster if I do it this way? It's like jQuery was kind of, you know, pleasant to work with. And the things that I was building, it didn't need a complicated framework. They're mostly either these very short-lived 
or one-off sites that could just needed a bit of extra functionality or extra some animations, quote unquote animation with jQuery's animate features. Um, but they just need like some extra sparkle to uh, to impress people. But after you know a while, started considering that maybe we should put things on mobile devices. And that led me to figuring out, okay, how do I get an app that's written with the web onto a mobile device, which led me to things like PhoneGap, Cordova, and then realizing complicated projects need some kind of structure. And so like the first couple iterations of these apps that I was build that I were building were backbone apps. And that was like my next hurdle of understanding how do I work with a framework and how do I structure an app better than just this giant spaghetti code of jQuery code. So how did you wind up getting into Angular then? Well, it was kind of frustration with Backbone. I built a couple things and it definitely it was better than the you know the spaghetti code and the home brewed kind of solutions or framework for lack of a better term that we were building. And we used Backbone pretty heavily for like six months. Um, I was looking at Ember at the time, and I really liked some of the characteristics about it, but I didn't like some of the opinionation, like how opinionated it was. And that's just my own personal preference. But I like this MVC approach. And so I was looking around for like MVC uh, JavaScript frameworks and Angular came up on one of them. And I was really hesitant uh, to learn it. I didn't want to learn Angular, to be honest, at the beginning. Because like, uh, what's this dollar scope thing? And dollar timeout? And what's a module? And there was a lot to like, again, a lot for me coming from my background uh, that I had to learn and understand. But after sitting down, there's like Dan Wallin's Angular in 60-ish minutes, John Papa's articles that he was writing. Uh, there was plen- there was some there was actual resources out there by the time I found it that kind of explained it better than what the docs were at the time. I don't know, and I just found it, and as I started building things out with it and watching some of their Google I/O talks, it was just one of those things like, okay, okay. I think I get it. And I'm obviously going back and forth like every other day. It's like, is this a good decision? Looking up the docs, trying to figure out, okay, what did I forget to do in this case? Like, I've got to inject something. And then after that whole process, like once you finally figure it out and like, oh, I, I built this entire thing and I didn't need to reference the docs once. I kind of felt like Angular was a nice place to be. And it, you know, it fit the, my mentality of how I wanted to build things. Nice. So how did you wind up uh, over at Ionic? So I had been building these uh, mobile apps uh, using PhoneGap uh, and previously had been using jQuery Mobile because that was like the only game in, ta- in town for like building cross-platform apps and giving you some kind of consistent UI. When I decided to like leave jQuery mobile and Backbone kind of behind. I had found Ionic first as the main framework and then saw that they were using uh, Angular. It's like, okay, well, I can use Angular, which I was already in the process of learning, and I can use Ionic as a UI, and I saw the bindings and directives and everything that they had to offer. And I just got really involved uh, in building things, and the community was like maybe... 200, 300 people at that point. So it was towards the end of 2013. And I had been super active on their forum. And I saw them post something online. It's like, hey, we're looking to hire some people to help manage the forum and manage the community. Uh, people should reach out. And I just tweeted at one of one of the member, one of the team members, uh, Adam, who's now my boss. It's like, hey, I see you guys are hiring. Uh, is this still a position available? They they sent me an email, a couple Skype calls later, and I had a part-time kind of contracting gig, helping out manage their form, build some cool demos, and just be like a representative from the community. Like anytime big issues would come up, I tell the team about it and kind of report back to 
the forum and to the users like, hey, they're aware of this. We're looking into it. Here's like the issue that you can go follow. Kind of DevRel before it was actually called DevRel. And yeah, that was, I went on for three months. And then they were like, hey, you're doing a really good job. You want to join full time? Yes. Yes, I do. You're my first startup job. Joined them full time and I've been there ever since. Very cool. So what are you working on now? Um, so obviously I work a lot on Ionic itself, working on the framework every now and then, doing a lot of work with docs. But I, between working on the framework and like everything that I do there, I've kind of found like this really nice interest in uh, to, the tooling landscape, like working with TypeScript, working with uh, Angular's build system, working with our own internal tools and kind of just understanding how that whole entire thing works. Uh, and that was super fun to like to get involved because it was building things on the front end can see, you know, while it's while it's kind of difficult, uh, I think the whole entire tooling side is a different kind of difficulty. But one that's when things work well, that reward is so like hard fought that you're just so happy that it's like, yes, it finally builds. It finally does what I want it to do. And it kind of feels more. I don't know. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say satisfying, but the that scratch that you're uh, that you're itching when you're trying to build something, it definitely it's it's a stronger sensation of like I did this versus oh I made some I made a background color the right the right gradient. Nice. About ten months before we started Ruby Rogues, which is the oldest podcast on DevChat.tv, I went freelance. And one of the things that I figured out pretty fast is that I had no idea what I was doing. And I made a bunch of mistakes. But I also made a bunch of friends who were doing freelance. And we got together and we started a podcast called The Freelancer Show. And The Freelancer Show has been running about as long as JavaScript Jabber. But we talk every week about all of the things that we were learning and doing in freelancing and giving people advice on how to get their business started so that they could go out and be independent if that's what they wanted. Nowadays, I'm not on the show anymore. But we have terrific people like Ruben Lerner and Eric Dietrich that come on every week and talk to you about how they run their businesses and give other perspectives on things that you can do. So whether it's how to find clients or whether it's how to step in and start doing training or other programs or how to run a business, they have a ton of experience and they talk about all kinds of things that are gonna help you pull things together and be successful as a freelancer. So whether you're thinking about moonlighting and trying it out or whether you're going whole hog and quitting your job, you should definitely check out The Freelancer Show and you can find that at freelancershow.com. So, uh, yeah, so it's just, it's interesting to see all the stuff that's going on with Ionic and Stencil and all the things that you're talking about here. Yeah, the the Stencil stuff with, especially, has been one of those things that have, I would say, I didn't expect, um, considering the, everyone's opinion on web components to begin with. So to see, like, I think I was probably one of the more vocal critics about it inside the company at first. It's like, this is, this is never going to work. This isn't going to be great. Why are we doing this? But then to see like everything come together and the community has been very receptive about it. I was like, okay, I was wrong. It's, it is a good thing and it does things really well and everyone's pretty happy with it. And to see that web components are actually like becoming a viable a viable option for building that UI layer and sharing that across all uh, different frameworks. That has been something that's, you know, really nice to see. It's like the dream of write once and write it cross framework can be achieved and people can use these components without having to rewrite them multiple times. Yep. Very cool. So what, what, what should we look for next from, uh, from folks like you at Ionic? Well, we're, we've been doing a lot of work recently on server-side rendering and figuring out how can we server-side render a web component. Uh, something that, I mean, up in, something that a lot of people have this idea that it's not possible to server-side render a component, um, but because we have this whole compiler that we can take advantage of with Sensel, we can ship these components in a way that you get all the components that are with inline styles, with everything kind of 
in the DOM on the server side. And then as it comes over and bootstraps the entire app itself, we're getting Shadow DOM and we're getting the web components uh, interacting natively inside the browser. So it gets really, really awesome, you know, progressive upgrade from here's just a static HTML file to now here's some of the interactive stuff. So we've been working on that just in a vanilla use case. Mm -hmm. um, we have some early versions and early tricks inside of Angular with Angular's Universal. We have the initial kind of outline for what we need inside of React. And then working on Vue uh, after we finish the first two, just to get that up to speed and get that at the same uh, level of features. So we'll be finishing that up hopefully soon and actually writing docs on it because it's server-side rendering. It seems like it'd be an easy thing to do. It's actually really difficult, especially with JavaScript. Yep. All right. Well, let's go ahead and start wrapping up. How do people find you online? Uh, they can find me on Twitter. Um, most active there. M. Hardington. First initial, last name. Pretty, pretty easy to figure out. Nice. All right. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Do you have any picks for us? Yes. The new, sorry to date this, the new Star Wars kind of trailer uh, for The Rise of Skywalker. I think that's, I think that's mm -hmm. the actual name. Yep. Came out recently. And I, I don't think I actually uh, like felt so excited for a trailer until I, uh, except for when I saw Endgame. This was probably one of those movies like, yes, yes, so much hype, so excited for it. So the Star Wars uh, Skywalker, Rise of Skywalker trailer, definitely check it out. Go see the movie when it comes out. It can only be better than uh, the last one. <laughs> it can't be worse. Because that was a pretty bad movie. Challenge accepted. Uh. <laughs> oh, man. Please don't yeah. hate me, Internet. Oh, well, uh, if they hate you, they can hate me, too. Because, uh, yeah, I was thinking... And then I, I, I say this, and then my wife just rolls her eyes and, you know, tells me to get over it. But, yeah, the, the last two Star Wars movies, or the last, you know, Episode 7 and Episode 8... <sighs> Like, especially, especially eight, like seven. I kind of saw it. I was like, okay, they put enough nostalgia into it and, you know, kind of gave us a reboot. And there were a bunch of winks and nods to the fans of the original trilogy. And I could live with it. Right. There right. were things in it where I was kind of going guys really, but I could live with it. Right. It, it felt like they were trying to do too many things with it. They needed to just, you know, they either needed to go full on nostalgia or, you know, Full on, you know, the, you know, uh, badass woman with Ray or full on with, you know, there were like three or four other things that I felt like they were trying to do with it. And they just needed to hit one or two of those, you know, and then maybe have a highlight of a third. And right. It, but, but it was like, okay, you know, you, you got us into the theater to see another Star Wars movie. And then... And, um, and it was better than the prequels. So... Oh, like, well, wait, wait, wait. Way to set the bar high, man. The prequels <laughs> were terrible. Yeah, I know. So, you know, you're already setting it's like, all right, the original trilogy, the prequels are down below it. Seven is here. Eight is like below the original, but kind of above the prequels because the prequels yeah. were that bad. Yeah. If if this last one is just above the original and kind of tied with seven, I, I would consider that a success. Yeah. So my take is with all of this, and and I love talking Star Wars. Um, in fact, uh, we're going to record the first episode of a Star Wars podcast tomorrow. I'm oh, doing nice. it with my eight year old, so it's going to be at that level. But nice, anyway. Um, yeah, and there's there's so much Star Wars lore and the uh, cartoons and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, um, but yeah, so eight was the whole time, the whole I like everything they did. I'm sitting there going, but why? <laughs> Why would you make this? Why would you put this in this movie? And then the next thing, it's like, okay, I have to forgive you the last thing because this is dumber. And yeah, how, so... How dumb can we get? Turns out pretty dumb. Yep. So what I'm really hoping is that, yeah, this last movie redeems it 
And what they really need to do is they need to kind of hand wave over the parts of the last Star Wars movie that they just can't justify in any way. And then they need to tie back in solid ways to the other stuff so that at the end of the day, I'm kind of going, okay, eight wasn't a total suck show. Does that make sense? <laughs> like, it's like, okay, I, they, they were setting me up for all this stuff. And I don't feel like I totally wasted my time going to see it. Right. <laughs> but and, and they, they could do it on some of those things. Mm-hmm. At the same time, though, it's J.J. Abrams. So his ability to just create things and then never have answers for them is unparalleled in this industry. He can just create mystery boxes out of nothing. Oh, and yeah. just will, like, do you want an answer for that? Sorry, you're not going to get an answer. Yeah. So a little healthy dose of skepticism, but high hopes that it will be better than the last one. Yeah, well, I love all of the Star Wars stuff. And I really wanted to love those movies, but I just didn't. So. <laughs> and and like the, the first one, it was funny too, because I walked out of there going, that was a good movie. And then as I walked away from it, I started thinking about it. I'm going, yeah, but, and I did that about eight times. And my wife's finally like, shut up. I liked it. <laughs> it's like, why do you have to ruin a movie with so much analyzing? It's like, but, but the, the, yeah, the, the eighth movie was, yeah. I just looked at her. I was like, do I even need to say it? And she's like, nope. <laughs> but the prequels, she she gets annoyed at me too because I pick apart the prequels. Anyway. And, and Avengers Endgame, I picked that one apart too and that drove her crazy. So, But it's still such... I I had the moment on, the, on a flight recently where I was watching Endgame and, you know, spoilers, towards the end, I'm just sitting there. It's like, all right, hold it together, Hardington. Don't get emotional. Don't get emotional. And I'm like trying to hold myself together. It's like, oh man, this is like so many years of things building up and ending at yeah. once. Yep. But yeah, I mean, part, part, of, part of my issues or part of the issue was that they sacrificed a little bit of plot to get the comic book moments in Endgame. Yeah. But, but it's a comic book movie. So I kind of went, okay. <laughs> what are you gonna what are you gonna do at the end yeah. it, it was fun it was entertaining it was well worth the money uh, for the ticket yeah well it's it's like uh some of the drama that they put into the star wars movies right it's a freaking space opera okay mm-hmm. so some of the drama just has to be there right it, it, it doesn't it doesn't all add up for the the plot but it's a freaking space opera so i'll get over it but right. yeah Anyway, I'm going to throw out some picks. Um, so I just finished a book a couple days ago called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And if you're trying to um, make improvements, I guess, to your habits, you know, do more of the things that you ought to do and less of the things you ought not to do, then this is a terrific book because he just dives into all the science behind behavior and why you do what you do and and helps you kind of pick apart, okay, these are the things that really, you know, make sense. So he kind of picks apart some of the conventional wisdom that doesn't have any backing scientifically. And then he comes back around and says, look, the science says that this is what's going to get you to quit. Or this is the science says this is what's going to get you to, you know, do better. Or the science says this is what's going to get you to do this thing that you ought to do. And so I'm, I'm really digging that. And then um, I started a new book because I've been doing this challenge. Uh, where I read 10 pages out of a book every day. And uh, it's called Super Fans, and it's by Pat Flynn. A lot of folks don't know who Pat is. He has a podcast called Smart Passive Income. Uh, it's an entrepreneurial show. He's a terrific guy. And anyway, so um, I have a signed copy because he was at Podcast Movement a couple <laughs> weeks ago. And so I got, yeah, I went to the launch party and they were giving out books. And then nice. I cornered him and made him uh, scribble in it with a Sharpie. So... <laughs> Um, yeah. And it's funny too, cause I'm not like a Pat Flynn super fan, but he was there. Right. So when, he, it, when the person is there, you might as well get their autograph. Yeah. So, so, so it's been interesting cause it, it kind of explains, okay, here's how you get people to move up the ladder in terms of being fans and you know participating in your community and things like that. So anyway, really enjoying that. So I'm going to pick that as well. Nice. All right, Mike. Well, that was fun. Uh, We'll go ahead and wrap this up and 
we'll come back around next week with another my javascript story cool thanks for having me bandwidth for this segment is provided by cashfly the world's fastest cdn deliver your content fast with cashfly visit 